collected was around um, the down payment, qualification, a number of people were concerned about the total cost of home ownership. Um, and that, that seems to be something that was a recurring decimal. People said it in different ways. Some people call it maintenance cost. Some people call it total cost of home, home ownership. You know, that was definitely um, something that, that was a recurring decimal, right? Now, in addition to that, some people talked about location and locality. Some people talked about taxes and tax benefits of home ownership, if there are any. So I think we'll just take all these um, one by one, right, and then start to address them. So uh, we'll start with the very first one. Tim, if you went. Yeah. So let's talk about qualifying. Um, and qualifying income to be precise. And I'll direct this to ESA for a start. Uh, as, a, as a big bank uh, mortgage specialist, ESA, what are, what are the typical parameters you will find and how do you think people can address the issues that arise um, from qualifying income, whether because the income is coming from unusual perspectives, either it's foreign income or it's income from contracting or it's employment income that is recent, i.e. the last two to three months. Um, what kind of challenges have you seen in your in your day-to-day -day, um, practice and what kind of solutions have you been able to prefer that you think our participants can benefit from? Hello, Isaf, can you hear me? Um, one minute, I know Isaf can hear me. I just need to make sure that she can respond. Okay, while we're waiting for Isaf, um, uh, Sky, can you just speak to the issue around qualifying income. I know there's, there's, there's things to do with term when you're talking about contracting. There are things, there are concerns around people that have foreign income. And there are also concerns around people who haven't worked for so long. So um, can you just share your thoughts about the kind of issues that you found come out and how you've been able to help people address them in the past? Um, yeah, like obviously the standard income verifications from the bank is for full-time employees they use letter of employment pay stubs um, any overtime income they'll use um, and any bonuses income they will use two years notice of assessment or to use tier t4 income on the same job and that's just pretty much a standard income confirmation period that's full-time now a lot a lot of times income does get tricky where people work overseas I see a lot of um, New to Canada applicants, like for example from Lagos, they, they come here and they've only been here for say like part of 2019, they came in March 2019. And the bank generally, they, they want to see two years of claimed income in Canada to use the overseas income. And overseas income generally has to be from a salary employee, employed job, not a, a self-employment um, applicants for overseas income jobs with most banks. Um, so in that case, they'll use two years notice of assessment for, for, to have full income qualify on a mortgage. I have gone exception in the past that the bank will take only one year. Like for example, if you make $100,000 a year, you've been here for eight months and you claimed just to say like 80 grand on your 2019 NOA, um, some banks will take that one year NOA and, and use that as a fully income qualifying um, application. There's a non-residence program as well with people that haven't claimed an income and a new to Canada program that can use income overseas or people that haven't found jobs in Canada that's quite new here. Um, so that is, they use 
to generate 35% down payment for those applications. Um, but yeah, with anything with 5% with 5% down, any insured mortgage with less than 20% down, most banks will use income, they need like the standard income confirmation. Um, there's, I can get more into it in terms of, every deal is different. There's definitely exceptions the bank can grant on each deal. There's like um, business for self applicants as well. So people that are self-employed, they have a um, enhanced business for self program that we can use uh, financial statements. So they're uh, just talking about qualified income is, you know, normally the bank use those down payment verification and um, the, there's debt service, uh, debt servicing requirement. Um, it's 32 gross debt service ratio, 42, uh, 44% total debt service ratios. Uh, so that's based on what mortgage payment you have, property tax, heat, any debts like car loans and secured credit and the mortgage payment combined, all those payment cannot exceed 44% of your total income. That's the general bank guidelines. Um, down payment, again, the bank is really strict on down payment verification because of the AML anti-money laundering requirement. So I usually get my clients to plan ahead if you don't want a bank to ask a whole bunch of questions. So say, generally the bank asks for three months bank statements for the down payment, the most re recent three months. If there's a whole bunch of deposit going in the account, like, you know, 2,000, 10,000, 5,000, they're going to ask the source of down payment. So if that's coming from overseas, they're going to want to see 90 days bank statement from the overseas bank statement. So it normally has to be traced. I tell my clients, if you don't want the bank, if you're going to have a whole bunch of transfers coming in, plan ahead, try to get the down payment in the account 90 days before you find a house. So that way you can have a clean printout without the bank asking so many questions on each transaction. Uh, minimum down payment is 5% um, for primary residence and second home, um, not for rental properties. Rental properties are 20% down um, with, mo with all the banks. Um, down payment can be gifted for, own, um, for owner occupy and second home properties. For rental property, it has to be from own savings. So as long as we can show 90 days, some bank will take 30 days. Bank statement that you, you, know, you have saved up in your account, they're okay to verify the source of the down payment uh, being your own funds for the down payment. So again, planning ahead is important for this for the down payment requirement. If there's lots of transactions that's coming in like in your account, they, they normally don't question pay deposit. Like you get tax refund. Like those are obvious that comes into your account. But anything like e-transfers, you know, AT, ATM deposits, those ones they'll question if there's multiple transactions like that. Um, total cost of ownership. Generally, um, there's lawyer fees involved, um, depending on the size of the deal. I'll say maybe budget up to around $1,500 for lawyer costs. Some will probably will be less. Um, there's moving costs and closing costs the bank require on um, insure mortgages, anything less than 20% down. They require, most banks require an insure 1.5% of the purchase price on top of the down payment in the bank account. So that's money that's not them taking away from you or not, you don't need to give that to a lawyer. It's just money that want to make sure you have enough funds in the account for moving expenses and such. Um, I have gone away with lots of deals. A lot of people don't have that, say 5% down payment plus another one and a half percent to show. So most banks will, will allow like a lawyer letter to confirm legal costs instead of proving that 1.5%. Um, so normally versus proving like say, $4,000 in your account extra, you can prove $1,500 for the closing cost. Uh, generally those are the, and that, and that's it's legit why the bank wants that, they want to see that because they want to make sure your account's not drained out, you have money for moving expenses, you know, maybe the first inches adjustment for your mortgages and, and such. Um, so that's why they want to see that in your account, but not, that's not something you have to come up with when you close the transaction. Uh, other than lawyer fees, obviously, and um, property tax adjustments. Um, yeah, that's just a, just a brief summary about, you know, those three topics. And um, yeah, I can get more into it because every deal is different. And, you know, everybody's situation is different. Some people have, um, I've gone away, people switch from a full-time employee to be a teacher, for example, and uh, at, say, Mount Royal University or at University of Calgary. 
all of a sudden they, they do consulting work. And some underwriters, some banks will allow, because you just become self-employed, they might allow two years of notice of assessment income on your previous job if you have to, if you show long tenure on the same um, employment or same role of work and as professional job. So every deal is different and there are exceptions can be made. Um, we can definitely, anybody have any questions, then feel free to reach out and I can um, assist further on those questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Sky, for providing that, that, that um, quick summary. Um, Isaf, can you provide us your views around your own experience uh, in terms of the kind of challenges that you've seen as a mortgage specialist dealing with um, issues around qualifying income, uh, down payments, and then the total cost of home ownership? Hi. Thank you, Doc. Can anyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. Sorry for the interruption earlier. I got cut off. No worries. Please proceed. Awesome. awesome. Um, nice to talk to you, everyone. And thank you so much for having me uh, join this meeting with you guys. Um, the qualifying rate um, with RBC is still at 5.04. Uh, the posted rate has dropped. It is a good time to buy here in Alberta. And the reason, it is a down market. It's a buyer's market, right? Um, the, the interest rate for insured mortgages are at their lowest by far. Prime rate itself has dropped. Um, we, the challenge with the income we're having right now due to COVID, uh, we need some sort of a confirmation that client is currently off because of COVID. However, they will return to work in two weeks or a week or, or, or such time. That's what we are, what we're asking for. However, whenever it's an insured mortgage, which is anything under 20%, we're having a little of a challenge with that for individuals who are currently not working due to the COVID situation. But whether it's a good time to buy or not, like everyone was saying, if you are paying rent, by all means, you are pay, you're, you're basically paying someone else's mortgage. You might as well go right ahead and do your own. Um, it is, if you can afford to, to pay the rent, you definitely can afford to, to buy something within your means, anything under 300,000 or something like that would be, uh, would be, uh, about what thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars in in a monthly payment. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um. Now, Isaf, if you want to talk about challenges around uh, down payments, people don't necessarily have that kind of cash sitting around. Um. Is is there any? Are there any um, instruments, methodologies, ways that people yeah. can able to? Uh, either use existing assets, use long-term savings or the money that they landed with or, you know, well, some kind of arrangement which allows them to be able to get over that, that hump. Is, is that something that you're seeing? Is there something that can be done in that space? As long, yeah, I've seen, I've had, I've had clients, actually one client just a couple of weeks ago, he has amazing income. However, he has no assets, no savings. And the reason he says, well, I don't need to save. I've been renting the same place for the, such, for the longest time. However, he wants to buy it now because the, the, uh, the owner passed away. He doesn't have the down payment. So if you have an existing line of credit, you can use borrowed down payment. So let's say you, your down payment is 15,000 and you've got a line of credit that has a zero balance right now. You can take that money out and use it as a down payment. As long as you qualify and as long as we take that payment, your monthly payment, the obligation monthly payment and put it against your liabilities, with your liabilities. So if you still, everything falls within line, you can use for a down payment. I can't hear you. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm saying that's definitely one of the ways that you've been able to um, use to secure or kill the down payment challenge. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, the line of credit needs to be um, like on, on, like you have to have the line of credit prior to applying for a mortgage. So you can't say you're applying and then you'll get the line of credit after. No, it has to be obtained prior to starting a mortgage application. Oh, okay. So you need to have had it for some time. Yes. How much, how, how long before? No one has said anything. As long as it's, it's there, right, prior to starting the application. Okay. At least that's, that's information that we can use. Um, so I, I will direct this back to, okay, to Sky now. In, with respect to down payments as well, apart from the line of credit, and then you talked about, um, I know you said some things around using business income, foreign business income that has been earned over the last year and declared in an NO in the past. What other methodologies are there apart from just straight up good old savings? Can be gifted down payment, the banks will allow as well. Um, so, We'll get the down payment, the bank generally will re require to be from immediate family members. So it can be parents, you know, grandparents and siblings. Um, okay. That's one source. Um, the one that you uh, talked about is the, the borrow down payment. Some banks has that program. I mean, RBC has that as one of the bank has a program. Um, yeah, again, that's one source that we can use, but with that service, that payment in. And generally the bank will use 3% of the balance as borrow. Uh, so you borrow 20 grand, they'll use $600 for payments. And some people, that type of down payment requirement does not work with the debt servicing. And some, some people that totally don't have a down payment, well, they can get it gifted from family. That's one of them. Um, and then obviously from the savings. And there's also the first time home buyers incentive program that the, the government, uh, CMC, the insurer launched, but that program, the, the clients will still need to come up with a minimum 5% on their own. And if they qualify under that program, then you know, for existing home, they'll do up to 5% of the purchase price uh, for the first home, um, home the buyer incentive program. And then for new homes, they'll do up to 10% um, for that program. But that, but that program is not a free down payment mortgage, it's you have to come up with 5% minimum on your own or from gifted down payments. Fantastic. Um, so what I'm hearing is gifts, gifts from immediate family, not from some strange distant yeah, uncle or, or, from an, or from a friend yeah. in, how, who's based in the British Virgin Islands or something like that. Definitely immediate family. Then yeah, the borrow it can be overseas, so it can be overseas gifted as well. It doesn't have the person doesn't have to be in Canada. Yeah, but the person has to be immediate family. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so I, I have a few questions from the audience right now. Um, somebody was asking, line of credit rates, ESAP, what are those right now? I know it's typically oscillating around prime. Yeah. So it's prime plus what right now for line of credit borrowing? No, normally they range from prime to 4.49%, uh, 5%. Every, every scenario is different because it takes everything into consideration. We don't price it we don't have a price so every client is different based on the amount based on the credit history based on a lot of things then the system generates that that rate but typically you you would look at about eight percent okay for a line of credit that is that's like the cap that's like the top of the rain rate yeah right? yeah prime okay. plus eight percent right okay. okay yeah the prime's at 2.45 right now yeah. Um, and some banks will use, most banks now they'll do interest only payments on the secure line of credits. So interest only payment for that, uh, for the payment amount, but the bank uses 3% of the amount borrowed for. Yes. So. Um, th thank you very much for providing that clarity. Now I, I want to talk about the total cost of home, home ownership. Now I'm not talking about this from a 
mortgage transaction perspective, but I'm talking about everyday life, right? So heat, electricity, um, waste disposal, um, managing the lawn, property taxes, what, what kind of change do you see happen between when somebody who is renting a condo and decides to move out into the bobs and take something, maybe he moved out of an 800 square foot condo downtown and moved into a 1200 square foot house. What kind of change do you see happen to their cost base from your perspective? Um, yeah, mainly it's I mean, property tax. That's one of them that they add on um, versus renting, they don't have property tax. Usually utilities, most people pay the only utilities if it's a single home. Um, I guess maintenance, right? The general maintenance costs of maintaining a home. Um, yeah, those are the, what I see for additional costs uh, on top of what generally people have to pay if they're used to rent uh, above and beyond like the rent, the mortgage payment. So yeah, property tax, heat, electricity, home insurance, that's another one of them. And then, um, yeah, the maintenance of the home, the general maintenance of the home. This, this sounds like something that's like a 50% job. Mm, I won't say it's 50%, depending on like what the purchase price and what, what, they, yeah. what they're renting it. Say they're renting, or you're paying $2,000 a month in, rent and they buy a house and then the, the mortgage payments only $1,700 a month. So property tax, you should budget around 0.65% of the value as an annual tax amount. And you can divide that by 12 for monthly payments. Um, heating generally the bank heat, the heat cost the bank use hundred dollars a month usually for qualifying purposes, but we all know that's going to be more depending on the size of the house. So, um, that, yeah, depending on what, what they're paying now in rent and what the mortgage payment will be. But if you're talking about $400,000, 450, that 350 to 450 range house, I'll say the property tax plus heat, maybe budget around like- 500, at least. Yeah, $500 yeah. easily, yeah. I think I will just uh, add briefly by saying your rental costs add another 30% to your rental yeah. cost, and then you're good for for the total cost, additional cost to a home, to a homeowner, if I if I'm corrected, so many, you know, plus or minus thirty percent increase. So yeah, I agree uh, with that. That, that. So that sounds like a floor, right? And that floor could rise, or is that a is that a top or a just a so bottom? It's an average. It's an average. Say thirty okay. percent increase is an average. It's so it's all about how you manage your other costs. Your insurance will be fixed. Your home insurance will be fixed. Your utility and the main, and the other maintenances are the ones you probably will grapple with. Again, it depends on the size of the house and all that. But averagely, you will do another thirty percent increase against your against your rental. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks, Francis. Deborah, could you provide? Is that is that does that line up with your experience in the GTA? An average of thirty. 30% rising costs, do you think it, it's significantly more or significantly less? I, I want to say it really depends. That's, that's the general term. That's my favorite uh, <laughs> thing, right? It depends. Because if you buy a condo house, uh, a condo apartment, and the condo fee is about $600 per month, then the 30% might be out of the window, right? Um, and I've seen houses in the GTA that the condo fee itself is 600 at six hundred dollars, oh, wow. if it's a, it's if it's an older property and you are using, I like um you know uh it's not a post here system, it will cost you more in the electricity and stuff like that. So generally, it, it really depends on the kind of property you pick up. If you buy a newer property, obviously everything is going to be energy efficient, right? So a person like that might put more in the down payment or put more in their mortgage than you know. So it really depends. Okay, so I, I really appreciate the issue that uh, Deborah just brought up right now, which is if you, when you're buying a place, make sure you're buying somewhere that's going to be easy to maintain. So you're looking at heating, heating. you're looking at 
um, electricity, you're looking at the lawn, lawn maintenance, you're looking at basically everything around that and trying to make sure that the numbers that you'll be dealing with are not significantly higher than you expected because the property is older or because of the neighborhood or because of some other factor. Um, which brings us to the next thing, um, locating a suitable property. So I'm just going to allow um, Francis to speak to this as far as um, Calgary is concerned. What should I be looking for if I want to buy a property? I'm a, I'm a single guy or a lady or I'm a, um, you know, I, I have a small, young family. What are the parameters that should be driving my view where I'm looking at? That kind of a thing. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, thanks again, Dalton. So, uh, what's gonna drive you? Your pocket, you know, your cash flow, <laughs> your cash flow essentially. Uh, start small. Uh, you're, you're moving from a rental property. You're not, except you win a lottery. Even if you win a lottery, I mean, you have to be sustenance, right? You start small. You're renting a property for 1,400, 1,500. You're not going to jump to a property of 2,500. You know what I mean? So, you know, first thing is your, your pocket, your, your, your income, your earnings. Uh, how we say, cut your code according to your size. So if you have, if you're first, like, if you're renting 1,500, you should transit tra to, tra you should move on to a, a mortgage that will literally do you what? 1800, 1900, you know, that's why I put that 30% um, average increase in cost. So, with that, in, that in mind, you will now look at the locations where you want to go, you know. Um, again, for single family, you're not looking for, oh, sorry, single person, you might not necessarily be looking for schools or other facilities but you know families you'll be looking for schools um, proximity to everything so that there's no long commuting but for me you know you can't overemphasize the, that part of cost you know it's a function of your pocket it's a function of your earnings it's a function of you know you managing you're not living outside your means basically um, i can't speak too much to that but for me it's all about it's all about your income about uh, watching your cost and uh, and growing gradually, you know. Small leaps, small leaps and bounds. When you start to hit the seven figures and you can you can start doing more more on the uh, on the other part. Thanks Francis. Debbie, do you want to answer the same question? Locating a suitable property from a an East Coaster's perspective. So um, for me, I want to say yes, um, I appreciate that answer. Your pocket definitely is important. But also, um, something more also important is your team, right? Your team of professionals, your real estate agents, your mortgage broker, your inspectors, all lawyers, accountants, if you're an investor, all of these people are the ones that are going to save you money in the long run. Having the right team to advise you on, you know, in the right direction, I think is key, right? I've seen a lot of people that they bought a house and, you know, maybe they gave them the wrong information or they weren't honest with them, you know? If you don't trust your team, interview two or three agents. If you don't trust them, if you don't feel like you're flowing through them, try the next person, right, before you start and do a lot of research on your own, right? Google, internet, ask as much questions so that you know what you're getting yourself into. So all those people are going to help you, like an accountant is going to help you if you're buying your second property. What is the best strategy of doing it? What, should you buy under an old company? You know, should you buy by yourself? Should, can I join with somebody else? Can I husband and wife? Like all these questions, you need a team of professionals, a solid team to help you um, make the right decision, also advise you in the right way. So um, that's, if, if it's one thing, that's one thing that I will say it's important. Thank you very much for that, Deborah. I appreciate that. Can I also um, oh, yes. So, Tim, can you just take us straight to the next slide? So, immediately after your comment on the locale, I also want you to speak to common pitfalls that you've seen 
um, first-time home buyers and investors make as as a lawyer whose perspective is basically watching the deal and you know sorting out the paperwork, ensuring that the buyer and the seller are okay, ensuring that the title is passed to the right person, all of that. So let's take your comment on the location subject matter and then you can just go ahead and talk about common pitfalls and mistakes that you've seen okay thank you <clears throat> yeah just you know uh, from personal experience and professional experience um, regarding locating a property one of the things you also need to look for is the neighborhood you are buying a property is it, is it a place you would like to live uh, for the next you know four five six years because Buying a property is not something you buy and then in the next two, three months, oh, I don't like this place, I want to move. I don't like people, you know, around me, I want to move. You know, so, so you need to find out about the neighborhood, even though it might be cheaper, it may not be the kind of neighborhood you want your children to grow up, you know, in. So you need to, you know, talk to your rator, you know, about, you know, your, your, your sensitivities, you know, the kind of people living around the place or what's the, what's the kind of crime rate in the place. You know, or is there the kind of place you want your children, you know, to mix up with other kind of? So, this, I mean, I'm talking of personal experience and what I've seen from you know uh, people who come and they, sometimes after some one or two, three years, they now say, oh look, I I don't like that neighborhood. I need to move on, and, and then you know they need to you know look. I mean, get another mortgage again. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe even more difficult for them to qualify. So you need to you know look at that. That's just my comment on. I don't know what the rators may want to say about that. Yeah, can, Hello, sir. Jude, you can yeah, go ahead can and talk about yes. Okay, great. Now, can you go ahead and talk about common pitfalls and mistakes that you've seen first-time home buyers make? Yeah, the, the, the first one I love to talk about is uh, if as well as investors you, too. Yeah, if, especially for new home buyers, if 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 a buying you know a new property, for instance, uh, you need to look at the papers. You need to look at the the, the purchase contract. You need to look at what you are getting into. You need to know, you know, if you put down the deposit, what are the terms for you to lose it if you don't come up with the balance? You know, you, you need to look at what I've seen from experience is that people just rush into signing those contracts. They don't look at it. Possibly they, they go to the show home, thereafter the, uh, the agent talks to them, they send it in to them and they sign, they scan back the stuff. And then down the line, you know, when they need to close, then they begin to see sometimes that they, that it's more a bit difficult for them, you know, to fulfill. So, so they need because some of even for some of these new homes, renters are not involved. Uh, at least the independent renters are not involved, so they are not able to guide, you know, the the, the, the clients. So, but from what I've seen, and again, if you are not clear about your contract, please get a lawyer involved. All the contracts are not cast in stone. Some people want to believe it's either you take it or leave it. It's not to have review contracts for people and I made suggestions for improvement. And the builder, I mean, agrees actually for the, you know, uh, the, the smaller builders. The bigger builders may say, well, that's their standard form. You have to sign or you leave it. But I can tell you some of them will see it. Again, talking about that, is issue of real property report. Uh, I've seen so many contracts that, the the, 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 um, the contract does not provide for the builder, you know, to provide the property report with compliance, services of compliance to the to, to the buyer. And this thing can add up if you are when you want to say is when you really know when there is problem because a property report will cost between seven fifty to eight fifty dollars for for you, you know, at the time you may need it, you know, and all of that. So so if it's not provided in your contract, you have every right to insist on it because the builder builds the property, is able to ensure the fence is the right location, is able to ensure that the setback, you know, the zone, the setback as required by the city, the bylaws are maintained. Otherwise, you buy and they didn't do all of these things. When you need to get, you know, I mean, said, then it becomes a problem. Your, your fence will be encroaching on, on a neighbor's property and you need to move it. So that, that's one of the, you know, things I, you know, really, you know, we'll quickly want to, you know, comment about. Second, um, um, talk to your lawyer before signing the mortgage documents in your lawyer's office. I'll get your lawyer to explain to you what you are getting into. Your broker might have explained some of the, you know, some few terms of the, of the, of the, of the mortgage to you, 
but there are some other terms that will come in the papers the bank will want you to sign that you need to know. Because uh, what I've seen that some lawyers, they rush you through signing, they go to the office within five to 10 minutes, you are done, sign the paper, they give it to you, pa, 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 you sign, you move. But it may be more than that. There are so many, let them explain to you what do you have in the standard mortgage terms? Um, what are your obligations you know, as, as, a, as a borrower? What are you supposed to do? What are you not supposed to do when it comes to the mortgage? What are your payment terms? And all of these things, you know, they, are, they are pretty important. And what is a high ratio mortgage? You need to know, you know some of these things. What are your payment privileges? These, are, these things are contained in the mortgage commitment or the you know, credit agreement with the bank, which you will sign the lawyer's office. But if you just, they, you know, they throw some papers at you and you sign, it's not as if you can change some of these things, but at least if you know what you are getting to, you are in a position to ensure that you don't default on your mortgage. Because there are so many, what they call events of default, that if you breach, then the bank has the right, you know, to, you know, commence foreclosure proceedings. For instance, you know, you are expected to pay your property taxes regularly. You are expected to maintain your fire insurance regularly. You know, I mean, and, and there are some things that you are expected to do. But if you don't know this, you may think, or you may take it casually. But for instance, you may be in trouble. Again, if you are if you are buying a condo, for instance, and you are defaulting on your condo payment, the condo board have seen even for just about five hundred dollars, they can commence you know action to recover the money from you, and then in the process of that, you know, some some foreclosure issues and all of that, and then even the lawyer that that they engage to recover the money from you, what he is charging you will be more than what you actually owe in the condo board. So you need to know some of these things, and is a lawyer who is getting to sign the document that you explain. Ask them, you know, for what you are getting so that you know exactly what you are doing. Is your mortgage, for instance, is it portable? Do you intend to maybe in the next two, three years, I mean, buy another property and then port the mortgage on the same terms? You know, these are some of the things, not all mortgages are the same, but you need to know, you know, some of these things. Um, I think the other one, for those who are buying condos, uh, I, I would advise strongly, that they take content and uh, improvement insurance. You know, banks don't require insurance when you are closing a condo, you know, transaction. They don't require fire insurance because the condo as a whole has its own fire insurance, which is what is required. But for you, you know, as the owner of the condo, there is a condo content and, uh, you know, structural improvement and, you know, a home improvement, you know, for the condo. The reason is that I've seen a client recently who, um, his property was flooded by a neighbor, the adjoining, you know, a condo. And then because of that, they now needed to fix the condo, as to fix condo, as to fix the place. And then the guy also, you know, they were causing so much nuisance and discomfort to her in her property because they need to fix the place, they need to change the carpet, they need to remove the tub and all of that. And she has to live through the noise. If there was a content and insurance, we should have included that kind of thing, the, the, the insurance could have reported the person to an hotel for the period they are, you know, they are fixing the place. And again, recently there was an amendment to the condo property act that enables um, the condo board to recover deductible, you know, from, uh, from from whoever causes an accident, a flood, a flooding, for instance, in in the you know in in his condo in his apartment, and this could be hefty. Now, if you have a condo insurance, this should cover the the cost of you know that deductible that you need to pay to the condo board. So these are some of the things you know I will note. Uh, on on a on a smaller note, this issue of title insurance. Um, recently, because of this COVID uh, situation, things are getting better, but now they, they they permit virtual signing of documents. Uh, there have been concerns from the law societies about people taking advantage of that, the fraud, you know, by people selling and all of those things. But even before then. I strongly advise my client to take title insurance. A one-time payment is not much. It depends on the value of the property. It could be maybe something like $300, $400 to protect your title to the property, to protect you in case there's an encroachment on a neighbor's property by your fence. Because of fixing all of that, the title, the insurance company will be it. So this is something you need to you know, consider when you are buying a property. Uh, I think um, possibly 
Uh, that is what I could say, you know, for now. Uh, but the other thing I want to quickly mention is the, the idea of um, um, if you are moving, buying a property you want to move in, you probably want to consider moving in in the middle of the week, like let's say Wednesday, Thursday, but not a Friday if possible. There are times when they are funding delays by the by the lender, and if you you know miss the twelve o'clock deadline, then you will have to pay penalty. You know, for the for for the I mean, uh, for one or two days. Now, if you are buying a new property, the penalty could be hefty. It's usually prime plus six or to up to twelve percent, and then that means if you take it on a Friday, you have to pay penalty for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and this could be hefty. There could be funding delay, which the broker may not have any. You know, may not have, it may not be the problem of the broker or the lawyer. It may just be a funding problem. You know, from the you know from the lender. So these are some of the little little tips that they want to give but you know i can ask any further question when it comes to a uh, lawyer so you in your estate closing thank you wow that that was a lot but i think i heard a few things but principal among them is don't try to go it alone get a professional to review your contracts um a lawyer to review your contracts and uh, any other subject matter really that is of legal consequence, get a lawyer to look at the contract and ensure they are looking at it from your perspective and protecting your interest. I think that's the principal thing that I've come away with from um, what GD has said. Uh, we have a number of questions, but we are running out of time. I want to crave the indulgence of the um, panelists as well as everybody else if we go over probably an additional 15 minutes we have about five questions and I'll just pose them to the panelists one at a time I hope that is okay unfortunately I have to leave I have a client meeting at 2 30 so I'm going I'm sorry <laughs> no it's fine if you don't yeah. if you can't stay we understand it's okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Dan. But I can text you guys all the, the, the answers if there's anything to do with loans, lines of credit, uh, interest rates, or anything like that. Okay, that, that's fine. So I'll share perfect. those questions with you, and then you can send me an email, and I'll share that with the group. After. Perfect, perfect. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Will do. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. So to my other panelists, um, uh, I will just... The questions I have, renting to own is an interesting subject matter that somebody brought up. Um, what, what can we say to that? And who would like to address that? Well, I can quickly, you know, keep in something about that. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, fine. Yeah, rent to own um, is an alternative to buying the property immediately yourself. Because rent to own usually, I mean, they are usually from people who who have, if if who have credit issues that they cannot immediately qualify, you know, for a mortgage to buy. Otherwise, why would you do rent to own? But it's a good way to start in the sense that you do know that um, you know in the space of three years, that property you are living in, you are taking good care of, will become yours if you meant if you fulfill the terms of the contract. So, for instance, you know, you could definitely there will be a little down payment. You know, by the land to the landlord, and then you pay something on a monthly basis, and then part of that, what you pay on a monthly basis, will go. You know, as some of the time, depending on the agreement, you know, to 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 as part of the final deposit, you know, for the for the property. But um, it's, it has its own risk, and you have to really consider it in the sense that if you default on the on the agreement, even though you have put put down some a, a hefty amount of money. At the end of the day, you default, just a little default. The landlord wants to take advantage of that, and they want to seize, they want to, you know, seize your, your, you know, your deposit. So, so it's something you really, you know, look, you really need to look at too. Uh, I have the experience recently of, of somebody who had a, an issue. He did a rent to own, and then, you know, he instead of hello, yes, we can still hear you. So, so it, I mean, and he started improving the property. About two years down the line, you know, he lost his job. He could not, you know, continue the, 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 the payment terms. At the end of the day, you know, he lost his deposit. 
he had improved the basement significantly and the landlord just you know closing on him and he, and he lost his money and that guy actually you know went bankrupt in the process so so these are you need to look at the terms of the rental you are going to do and it may be a good alternative to after buying but then it has its own pitfalls thank you thank you very much Judy, for that response um now somebody was asking when it comes to warranties right uh a warranty insurance and then an old property versus a new property uh what, what kind of differences are they likely to experience so Say that again, uh, Ayo. So, as in, in terms of a home, a home warrant, home warranty insurance, right? What kind of differences would somebody buying a new property be experiencing compared to somebody who's buying an older building? Home warranty insurance. Yes. Yeah, can I, 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 can I think he's in... talking about Tarian warranty and all of those things. Yes. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I, I may not be able to speak for Ontario, but I do know in Alberta, there's a new home warranty law. Hack. It came into effect about three years ago or so. And that is to actually protect buyers, you know, from shoddy performance by builders. And um, it, it's mandatory, you know, on the part of builders to obtain that for any new home, you know, for, their, for the buyers. And what it basically does is to, you know, protect buyers against, you know, some defects in, in the property, for instance, and it is it, graduated. Um, for, for minor defects, you have an insurance, a new, a new warranty insurance for about one or two, one or two or three years. No, the first year, the first year is wear and tear. First year is wear and tear. Then second to fifth year is the other one. Then five to 10 years is a structure. Okay, that's the coverage period, right? That's a coverage period. Continue, sorry, sorry to cut you. I just wanted to help you out. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I, I mean, so it, it is to, so that's the benefit of a new property. But for an, for an old property, you know, new warranty will not apply. But if the property is a relatively new, you can, you can, you transfer the, 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 the current owner will transfer to the, you know, to the new owner for the, for new, you know, properties. So it doesn't apply to all properties, it applies to you know, new properties. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that an older building, the, and the existing insurance will stay in place if there is, an existing warranty insurance will remain in place if there is one, and if the building is out of a warranty period, then there's no warranty, and it's you just maintaining your um, home insurance and your content insurance and all those things. Is that correct? Sorry, hello? Yeah. I said, oh, sorry. So, just clarifying that if the building is still in warranty, the old, the original owner will transfer the warranty to the new owner. If yes. the building is out of warranty, then there is no warranty insurance. And all you have to, all you will do is procure your home insurance that covers your roof, your structure, and if you like your contents, as the case may be. Is that correct? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Deborah, is that different on the East Coast? Uh, it's the same thing, but bear in mind, newer homes because of that and other factors are slightly more expensive than the older ones, right? So um, you're basically paying for everything too, so. But yes, it's, it, the starting warranty can extend up to 10 years, but it covers different parts for, you know, as a progressor. So how are home buyers protected when they buy older homes then? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, me speak to that. let me borrow that a bit. Let me borrow that a bit. So if you buy a house that is over 10 years, you're literally on your own. You're not covered by any warranties. So whatever wear and tear, maintenance, or whatever comes after it, you are typically handling it by yourself. So that's where you get into when you're buying a house that is older than 10 years. I think it was 2009 or 2014 that this, this uh, program came into being, wherein uh, builders or developers uh, 
do a bond with Alberta, you know, and then such that once they finish building, a warrant, when there's a new building in place, a warranty kicks in for 10 years uh, for, the, for, the, for the owner. So if you're buying a house that is out of 10 years, you're not protected by that warranty, plain and simple. But in most okay. cases, um, that's when I suggest to my clients that if you have a corners or you have roof or all those things, you should buy a, 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 you know, an insurance a maintenance plan to cover something, something like that. So you cover plumbing, uh, you know, uh, oh, your nice. corners, all your, yes, AC, uh, fireplace, stuff like that. And that's, uh, for me over here, uh, it's, it's like $30 a month, right? But I have the rest of mine that if something was to happen to my furnace during the winter, they will run here and fix it for me. So, and I, and I think it's worth it. But in how some about, cases, if I want to... How about roof, canopy? Uh, well, our roof is really, we don't, I, I personally don't didn't do insurance for that. I don't know, even know if there's any insurance for that. Okay. But you know that roof expires every 15 to 20 years, right? Sure. So when you're buying a house, you know, if it's 10 years, then you, you have to do all your analysis. And agents will also do those analysis for you and say, okay, mm -hmm. listen, this roof, you might need to change this in one to two years, right? Over here, it's like $3,500 to change your roof. So I might have factored that in when you're buying a house, right? But so everything really depends. When you're buying an investment property and it's a 50-year-old house, there's no insurance, right? So, but you still do your due diligence to make sure that you cover your back and mitigate all this risk. If, if I can quickly chip in. Hi. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I think one other way to a little mitigation is to ensure that, you know, before you remove your home inspection condition, ensure that you get a very good home inspector. You know, that, that will, you know, that will ensure that you don't, you know, inherit, you know, a problem that is already existing, that is not latent. It's only latent defect, you know, that you can sue your seller for. But if it's not latent defect, get, get it. it's important that you get a very good home inspector at the time you are buying so that you know they look at all the problems that are already there and then you get the, um, the seller either to fix it before you know the possession date or there's an old bag to protect some of those issues you know so so but what i'm saying in essence is a good home inspector uh, before you finally you know conclude the deal you know is pretty important okay um so those are so basically one protections against old property get a good home inspection done secure the appropriate insurance to protect yourself in case of a major breakdown so that you can um so that you don't have to come cough up all that cash and then you can pass that cost on to an insurance company to handle the replacement for you okay thank you very much for those responses uh there's one question that has been recurring in the chat screen and i'm going to direct that to sky um, so, Sky, how does a student loan affect the mortgage application, or, or vice versa? How does, or, or how does a student loan affect the mortgage application if it has any effect at all? So, the student loan, some student loan hasn't does not report the payments on the credit bureau yet. Those ones, some every bank has a different policy. So, some bank would take one and a half percent of the payment is not reporting because of the loans are not repayment yet, but they're still outstanding on the credit bureau. If it doesn't show on the credit bureau, then the bank generally like, doesn't really care about that. Um, but if it shows on the credit bureau, have, um, they will use 1.5% of the amount outstanding as payment. It's actually better when, when it's on, when on repayment term, usually the payment is actually lower than 1.5%. So they'll, they'll include whatever amount is reported on credit bureau. Some banks for student loans, they, they, they take 3% of the payments. Some use the uh, Canada Student Loan Calculator for payments, depending on which lender. But um, the most, the, generally the, the lowest payment they'll use is if, if they're reporting on, on the credit bureau, that there's a repayment term. If it shows nothing, then they, depending on which lender we use, they, they use their guidelines for a student loans calculation. But then, so, yeah, anytime there's a loan reporting, they have, we have to include uh, some, as include, the payment has been included, even though you're not, it's not under repayment terms. Okay, so if I'm hearing you, um, 
basically the the student loan is going to be considered as personal debt which yeah. will now determine the debt service rich ratio which drives whether you qualify for the mortgage or not yeah that's correct so so even if the loan isn't coming up on your credit bureau um once you indicate that you have a student loan and this is a principal they would use there's some kind of internal um capacity to determine what that number is and how that number eats into your uh debt service ratio yeah that's correct so like generally they'll report even though it's not in a repayment term like it'll, unless it's brand new like unless the client just got it like two weeks ago then it may not report but once it's a report in a credit bureau the bank will use their own guidelines for calculation if the payment is not reporting yet or then it's not in the repayment term okay um let's see i i think I think those are most of the questions that we have. We have just three minutes left and I don't want to go over any further. Um, first things first, I, I want to thank everybody who came on um, for coming through. Team is running the appreciation. So you see everybody that has been involved in the process of making this happen. You all can see me, but there's so many people behind me. So I want to thank first thank everybody that came here to be part of this, to be part of the audience, to hear our panelists speak. Um, from the guy, the, my colleagues outside Gigs and Extra Bar, the Calgary Niger Group, the NNC, um, our strong connect to them, Idris. Uh, definitely, Tim, can you go to the next slide, then we'll come back to this. Yes, the network of Nigerians in Canada, Life in Canada, WhatsApp, the Girls Hangout, the GTA Connect, the PwC Alumni in Canada Group, Edmonton's Greatest WhatsApp Group, um, Destination Alberta, the Calgary Connect Tel Telegram Group, the Soccer and Balance WhatsApp Group, Calgary Niger PR, PR Citizens Telegram Group, the ITL Network, um, Niger Lawyers in Canada, and all the other WhatsApp groups where these were shared and where um, people have come from. Thank you all for coming in. I want to thank my five panelists. Thank you for responding to me at such short notice. Uh, Jide, who I met back in 2014, and I had no idea we'd be doing this kind of thing together. Sky, who happened to be a fellow advisor to another client back in 2016. Deborah, who I just connected with last week, and Francis, who is a member of Side Gigs and Extra Bar. And of course, Isaf, who has, uh, Isaf, who has, being a personal advisor to me in my own uh, real estate transactions. So I just want to thank every single one of you because if you did not show up, then we do not have a gathering. And for coming here, I hope we've learned a thing or two that will be useful to us. Uh, the slides will continue to show the contact information for our professionals so you can take that down for your consumption and use. Uh, Francis has something he actively wants to say. Francis, go ahead. Final word. Honestly, 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 employing a realtor or a mortgage broker doesn't add to the cost of your mortgage. Uh, this, the, the, the buyer doesn't pay the realtor. The buyer does not also pay the uh, mortgage broker. We're all paid by the seller or working for the seller. All we need to do is guide the buyer appropriately the lawyer will do a closing cost, but I think for what they would advise you on, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a token. That's my closing, that's my closing talk. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. And, and, and to all the guys who are looking to get information about real estate investing, we'll definitely be taking that topic shortly. Um, whether it's sometime in June or in July, as the case may be, is because the interest is there. And we only want to talk about what people are interested in talking about and concerned of. So uh, at that point, we'll be addressing issues around investments and building a team of professionals to support you as you do your deals and close your transactions. Um, so I just want to thank everybody once again. And uh, I, I will be sharing the links to the recording. I will also be sharing all the information that we've been able to pull together um, during this session. So, uh, final word from our other panelists, Jide. 
Well, I want to thank you all for inviting me to the you know to um to this forum. Um I appreciate the time and you know we're always available like uh, Francis said, um, if you have a good lawyer at your side, it enables you to you know address any issue that may arise in the process of closing. So you know take advantage of that. Your rator will su suggest a good lawyer to your computer, you know. I know it, it, there are many ways to get a good lawyer, you know, ask for recommendations, you know, and all of those things. Fantastic. Sky? Yeah, Sorry, thank you so much for having me on the, this panel here. It's great to share information yeah, well. with everyone. Um, yeah, any questions, just feel free to contact me. My hey, boy. Phone, as you can see on the slide. So anybody have any questions, feel free to email me or give me a call. But yeah, I appreciate you uh, having me on this panel. Thank you. Deborah? Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. It's been a uh, pleasure and a privilege sharing this information with you all. Like Francis says, <laughs> real estate agent doesn't cost you anything. I, I hear a lot of people that say, so how much am I going to pay? It really does not cost you anything, um, but you know, it's going to give you a lot of value. And it's important to get somebody that speaks your language, right? Not your language in terms of your literal language. I mean, in terms of your objectives. So thank you so much, everybody. If you have questions, I'm sure that someone will share my information. Thank you. Fantastic. So thank you all for showing up and uh, you. You, you all enjoy the rest of the evening. Tim, you can just leave the rest of the slides going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take your hand, my dear, and bless them both in my you know to stop me dead while I was passing by And now I beg to see you dance just one more time Ooh, I see to see to see to every time You people know this